Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to All Things Fulfill. And in this video, we're going to talk about another point from Phelan McPhelan, who is a historical premillennialist. He has made several arguments to claim that the reason Christ has not come and all things have been fulfilled is because of some contingencies that took place through the uh, rebellion or lack of faith on the part of the Jews. And one of the arguments that he makes is on Matthew chapter 24 and verse 34. Uh, in this particular argument, he says that um, this generation will not pass away does not mean that they would not pass away by extinction as all other generations passed away. Rather, he says it means that they passed away because they lost their religious headship. Now, there are lots of people who um, come up with different ideas about what Matthew 24, 34 means because they understand how powerful a text it is and how clear and how simple the text is without us having to try to interpret it. Just read it and accept it or reject it. And so many futurists choose to reject it. Now, some will apply it to 70 AD, but they'll think that the rest of the context uh, refers to the future. But you have those like, Phelan, who is a historical premillennialist, that rejects it. Some people will say, well, you know, it wasn't written in English. It was written in Aramaic. And the Aramaic for, word for generation doesn't mean the same thing as the Greek. Or they'll say, well, you need to read it in Hebrew because it doesn't mean the same thing and uh, as it does in English. But, you know, they don't have a problem with Matthew 23 and verse 36 that says all of these things will come upon this generation, they know that that would come upon that generation before it was or became extinct. Even noted premillennial dispensationalists who will agree to that. But when they get down to verse 34, historical premillennialists and dispensational premillennialists will say, well, it doesn't mean that in this particular verse. So what are we going to do with the verse? Saying that it just meant that their religious leadership or headship was cut off doesn't cut the mustard. And we're going to give you some reasons why that's the case. First of all, all that means is that they were cut off from the covenant. If they lost their religious headship, that just means they were cut off from the covenant. Now, how does that change what Jesus said? In other words, that this generation will not be cut off from the covenant until all things written are fulfilled. Uh, Philo needs to tell us when the first century Jews, when Israel was cut off. I can give you a couple of passages that would uh, tell us when that occurred. Let's take a look, for example, at this text, Matthew 8, 11 and 12. And I say to you, that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, there's a cutting away or not just of their religious headship, but of all those who rebel against Christ. Isn't that also precisely what Moses predicted for their last days? In Acts, the third chapter, starting in verse 22, notice what Peter said. For Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Now, wait a minute. Moses said that God was going to raise up a prophet for Israel from among their brethren who would be like him, but... He said, him shall you hear in all things, whatever he says to you. Now, who was that prophet? None other than Jesus Christ. When did that occur? In the first century. Now, watch the next statement. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. So he's telling them this would take place in that generation. How do we know that? Because in verse 21, well, even before 21, let's read verse 24. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow 
as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. Those were the days of Jesus and his apostles. And hence, verse 21, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the age began. That's the same concept of Matthew 24, 34. It's saying the heavens would receive Christ until the times of restoration of all things which God spoke by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the age began. You see, we can understand one generation comes, another passes, but the earth abides forever from Ecclesiastes 1.4. We can understand Matthew 1.17, all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, from David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations, and from the captivity of Babylon unto the Christ are 14 generations. So what happened? One generation came, passed away, another generation followed them, passed away, and another generation followed them, all the way down to Christ. But what do you think happened to the generation in Christ's day? It passed away as well, just like all of the previous ones. And hence, this is what Moses said. Let's take a look at 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter 1, beginning at verse 10. Peter says, concerning the salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. He's writing to people in his generation. And he says, searching what or what manner of time. So they wanted to know what the manner of these prophecies were and how they were going to be fulfilled. And they also wanted to know the time. And Peter tells them in the verse, he says, the spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating so what manner and what manner of time was the Spirit of Christ? That means they were inspired by God not to lie. The Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand what? The sufferings of Christ. Now, did that occur in the first century? Of course it did. We just pointed that out. And the glories that would follow. And on this glories that would follow, if we go to 1 Peter 5, I'll be right back here in a moment. And look at verse 1. Here's what Peter said about the glories that would follow. He says, the elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. So same subject as in chapter 1. And also a partaker of the glory that is about to be revealed. The word mellow is used here, and it means to be about to. To occur. So when you go back to 1 Peter chapter 1 and read verse uh, 11 that says, when he testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow, we should read this the same way that we read 1 Peter 5 and verse 1. And the glories that were about to follow. What were they about to follow? The sufferings of Christ. Now let's see if the next verse bears that out. To them it was revealed, that is to the prophets, it was revealed that not to themselves. Why? Because, you know, when the prophecies ended basically with Malachi, and we have this gap between uh, the period of Malachi for about 400 years, and then when John the Baptist comes on the scene, the scripture says the law and the prophets were until John, but since that time, the kingdom of heaven is preached, and every man presses into it. So starting with John, you have the preaching of the kingdom. But notice the scripture says, to them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us. Who's the us there? the people living in the first century. How do we know? Because it says they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven things which angels desire to look into. The Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost. Acts 2, 16 through 20. And it continued to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 20. 1 Corinthians 1, 6 through 8 which is the coming of Christ, by the way. And he says, these things were now reported. 
that three little a three letter word says now peter didn't indicate that oh it can't be now because the jews didn't believe but we see precisely what the word of god says and so uh there you have it he says these things happen in their time now if we go to hebrews chapter 7 we will see how and in what circumstances the headship was taken away. The headship of Israel was their priesthood. They were the rulers. So the scripture says, therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, he's going to give you the reason why that headship was taken away. For under it, the people received the law. That means the people were sub in subjection to the law through the priesthood. He says, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? Why are you going to change the priesthood if everything is going to be the same as it always has been? But watch, for the priesthood being changed, why was it being changed? Because there was no perfection under it. No perfection under the Levitical priesthood. Doesn't matter how hard and how loud people stand on the street corners and shout. You got to obey the law in order to be saved. The scripture says there was no perfection under the old law. And perfection in 1 Peter 1 and verse 9 is defined as the salvation of the soul. So he says, if salvation of the soul where through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, why was it changed? Because there was no perfection. Of necessity, there is also a change of the law. Now watch how the headship changed. He says, for he of whom these things were spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man is officiated at the altar. So it couldn't have been anything related to the Old Covenant because they all officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah. Isn't that a different priesthood than the priesthood of Aaron? Of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. So there's the headship that has changed. That's God cutting off their headship, cutting off the Levitical priesthood, exchanging it for the priesthood of Judah. So what does that mean? For on the one hand, there is an annulling, bringing to an end, dismantling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made what? Nothing perfect. The law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw nigh to God or near to God. So it was this hope through Jesus Christ that brought about the perfection. Hebrews 10 and verse 9 says, then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. So he took away the one that couldn't bring about perfection. When we look in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the verse is 7. He says, But if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? Now watch this. Verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. So stop letting these people drag you back into bondage and place you under the law. Now that's not what McPhailin does, but his doctrine does it because he's arguing that everything hasn't been fulfilled. 
And that's the consequence of that doctrine, even though it applies to others who make that their major theme and mantra. But he says, for if what is passing away, that's the glorious, as he said, was glorious, what is remaining is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Well, that was their hope in the first century. It's now a fulfilled hope. They were being changed, transformed into the same image, the image of Christ, from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And so from that perspective, uh, those things have been fulfilled. The Bible says that God would take the kingdom from them and give it to a nation, bringing forth the fruits of it. And once again, when that temple fell, that's when God brought judgment on those in the first century and that generation has passed away. It's gone extinct. But he says, assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. That was the generation in the first century.